Chapter 14, Assets and Demographics As we learned in previous sections, our nation has historic, never-before-seen levels of debt and an historic failure to save. Now, some would say it's not reasonable to look only at debt and savings. One also has to consider assets. After all, does it really matter if you have no savings and a million dollars of debt if you have assets worth $10 million? Well, that's a great point. So we're going to take a look at assets here. All right, so what's an asset? One definition is items of ownership convertible into cash, total resources of a person or business as cash, notes and accounts receivable, securities, inventories, goodwill, fixtures, machinery, or real estate. So an asset is something of value that can be converted to cash or provides access to or enhances a flow of cash. If we said simply that assets are deposits, uh, real estate, stocks, or bonds, and the stuff we own, we'd pretty much cover the vast majority of what we consider to be our assets. As we saw earlier, the liabilities and assets of the U.S. and state governments are really the liabilities of its citizens. But do remember, as we noted in Chapter 13, the U.S. government has a total net worth of negative 50 to $85 trillion. In fact, that mismatch between assets and liabilities does not belong to the U.S. government. It belongs to you and me and everybody else. Our national debts and liabilities are, well, ours. On the private side, the assets of companies belong entirely to the bondholders and shareholders of that company, not the company itself. And who are those? Ultimately, private citizens. Since we can pool citizens into households, we could examine household assets, deduct some relevant liabilities, and get a decent view of where things stand. And we do this because the Federal Reserve happens to track net worth at the household level, and this data is routinely and widely reported in the media. In fact, according to the Federal Reserve, household net worth has exploded by nearly $20 trillion in only five years, an astonishing feat and it represents more wealth than our country managed to amass from its inception until the late 1980s. And these are net assets, so the Federal Reserve and many in the media take the position that with just under $60 trillion in net worth, Americans are doing just fine and our rapidly climbing levels of debt are no cause for concern. But before we get too excited about the astonishing wealth indicated here, there are two key oversights and a fallacy hidden in this report, of which you should be aware. As always, the devil's in the details. Before I address those, I want you to observe this period right here, spanning from 2000 to 2003. That dip in the net worth of households was due to the stock market collapse that ran from 2000 to 2003, and caused such great panic at the Fed that Greenspan lowered interest rates to the emergency rate of 1%, thereby igniting the greatest of housing and credit bubbles in all of history. And this decline in net worth leads to this observation. Debt is fixed. When you take on a debt, there it placidly sits, until and unless you make payments on it. Debts do not vary with the general economic conditions, or whether you get a raise or lose your job. Assets, on the other hand, are variable, sometimes gaining and sometimes losing value. And so this leads to the eighth key concept of the crash course. Debts are fixed, but assets are variable. Okay, where did that $19.8 trillion in new wealth come from? Well, about 80% of that growth came from a rise in financial assets, and the remaining 20% came from growth in real estate and other tangible assets. When we look at how much of each type there was, we see that 72% of the total net worth consists of financial assets, totaling about $41 trillion, while the tangible assets are the remaining 28% and total around $16 trillion. If we examine these assets a little more closely, we see that the $41 trillion worth of financial assets consists of things like pension funds, the assets of privately held businesses, deposits, stocks, and bonds, which we can roughly recompose into these four main classes, stocks, bonds, cash or deposits, and the assets of privately held businesses. The other bucket of $16 trillion in tangible assets consists primarily of real estate, which is 75% of this bucket, and consumer durables, 
which would be your car, your dryer, and uh, your snowblower if you happen to have one. For every single one of all of these assets on this page, except cash, in order to liberate the wealth from these assets, you'd have to sell them first. Now, one general rule of asset markets goes like this. Things go up in price when there are more buyers than sellers, and things go down in price when there are more sellers than buyers. Hold on to that thought for when we get to demographics. Now, let me expose a great fallacy of the household wealth report. I'll use real estate to make the point. Suppose you have a house that you bought for $250,000, and over time, say the last five years, it went up in assessed value to $500,000. The Fed would record this as a $250,000 increase in your net wealth. But there's really no way for you to easily get to that wealth. Sure, you could borrow against that, but that does not liberate the wealth. It only exchanges an amount of it for debt. But suppose that you sold your house. Well, if you wanted to move into an equivalent house, guess what? They've all gone up in price along with yours, and so you have to spend $500,000 for an equivalent house. So, nope, no wealth was liberated there. In fact, the only way to liberate the wealth in your house is to downsize and buy a smaller one, or rent. So here's the rhetorical question of the day. How could everyone downsize? You might be able to, but on balance, everybody can't. At least not without creating a massive glut of large homes and a desperate shortage of smaller ones. And if everyone can't do this, then it means that it's impossible to ever release the full value or embodied wealth of all the houses. So the wealth number is fun to look at individually, but it is more or less meaningless as a whole. This same dynamic is true for other assets as well. Sufficient buyers are essential, or the wealth is as good as stranded.